Ted Cruz, f***ing this f***ing guy, he goes on and on about how Democrats are complaining about getting tens of thousands of documents twos of hours before the hearing, which, yeah, Ted. And they're questioning Kavanaugh's character, yeah, Ted. Etc. And it culminates with this. But it is at the end of the day simply an attempt to distract and delay. Yeah, no sh Ted is what someone should have shouted in that room in that moment. So he'd have to respond to it. Hey Ted, yeah, we're trying to delay it. That's what this is. It's politics, Ted. And that has consequences for people. And so we're trying to delay it. You'd do the same thing if you could, and we know that because you did, Ted. You stopped the nomination hearing from happening for eight months because of an upcoming election. As your colleague, Lindsey Graham, like a minute ago said, if you want to pick judges, you have to win an election. And that's true, I suppose, good sirs, because there's a fucking election in two months after two years of the majority party pushing through legislation profoundly unpopular with the public. And so in a couple of months, Ted, some of us, Ted, might not be here anymore, Ted. And you're so principled, yet all of you conservatives seem extremely cool with a lifetime justice being nominated by the guy under investigation for obstruction of justice. And maybe we should all take a moment to talk about that fact. Somebody say that in the room, please. Just like say, yeah, Ted, the president is implicated in crimes, you see. And here he is, potentially picking a judge that will choose his fate. And hey, Ted, remember when you were supposed to endorse Donald Trump at the Republican convention, and you went out there and you said, vote your conscience. But some people booed and now f***ing look at you? Remember that, Ted? Remember now look at you, Ted? But more than any of those reasons that we should maybe cool it right now, remember when you said, Ted Cruz, that if Hillary Clinton was elected, you wouldn't ever fill a Supreme Court vacancy? Or as I'm going to directly quote you, there will be plenty of time for debate on that issue. There is certainly long historical precedent for a Supreme Court with fewer justices. I would note just recently that Justice Breyer observed that the vacancy is not impacting the ability of the court to do its job. That's a debate that we are going to have. Are you? Ted, are you going to have it, Ted? You, and I don't want to be rude, wormy little guy. And you know what, f*** it, all right. Here's our new segment, legally distinct from an old segment called Petty Joke Junction, Petty Jerk Jokes, one. All right. Ted Cruz, you look like you just found out you were Ted Cruz. Wowee, it's news. It's been about a week since the 2018 midterm elections, and after weeks of reports of voter suppression and disenfranchisement and wondering what color the wave will be, it happened. And some results are still being counted, while some are, well, Florida's doing its thing again. So we'll see. But either way, news-wise, the wave was the color of the Democrats gaining a still-growing majority in the House, at least seven flipped governorships, and a moderately progressive Democrat closing the gap in Texas, while Ted Cruz got 200,000 fewer votes than he did in 2012, even though 600,000 more people voted in 2018. Ted? Millions of people are getting cut off of COVID relief. And in fact, many people never received the relief they were supposed to get. Some argue, however, that this is actually a good thing because financial relief during a pandemic makes people entitled and lazy. The policy that Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats are pushing adds an additional $600 a week of federal money to unemployment. We have the unemployment system. The system right, and McConnell wants to take it down to 70% of prior Except wages. The problem is for 68% of people receiving it right now, they are being paid more on unemployment than they made in their job. And I'll tell you, I've spoken to small business owners all over the state of Texas who are trying to reopen and they're calling their, their waiters and waitresses, yeah. they're calling their busboys, and they won't come back. And of course they won't come back because the federal government is paying in some instances twice as much money to stay home. So that was Ted Cruz arguing that offering COVID relief benefits of $600 a week is excessive because that's more than what low wage earners were earning before. Cruz thinks it's ridiculous we're offering more financial aid. Why can't people just live off whatever their state offers as unemployment? Well, each state has its own unemployment system, and it turns out that not having a universal social safety net makes things complicated. 
State bureaucracies aren't equipped to have to suddenly respond to mass unemployment, sending out huge amounts of unemployment benefits in the midst of a pandemic. Also, the fraction of wages replaced by unemployment insurance varies by state to state. And they can't quickly change these rates in response to mass unemployment. Take, say, a worker in Alabama, and they make $500 per week, which according to Ted Cruz is enough for them, and they lose their job. Under Alabama law, the maximum unemployment compensation they could receive is $275 per week. But what if their rent is more than that? Assuming they even get their unemployment insurance payment, they're in danger of being evicted without the supplemental $600 relief. So the only way to make sure millions of people aren't suddenly unable to feed and house themselves is to give nationwide unemployment benefits. And since state unemployment insurance systems are built on top of ancient pivot tables created in Excel 95, it makes more sense to just give everyone a standard amount. And if calculating a specific amount for each individual was an option, You'd think Ted Cruz would suggest it. Weird. Wonder, wonder why he doesn't suggest that. Of course, even the Nationwide CARES Act relief is not managing to reach everyone. So that's, um, it says cool, but I think it's being sarcastic. But hey, maybe Ted Cruz is right. Financial aid during a pandemic is going to spoil people, especially if it's more than the paltry sum they usually earn during their lowly jobs, such as providing food or farm labor or sanitation or building things in a factory that gets the real hard workers like Jeff Bezos lots of money. You know, jobs for people inferior to the Colonel over here, whose job is to tell other people that they aren't worthy of being paid too much money to live. Maybe once people get a taste of the sweet luxury life of getting a basic amount of money to be able to feed and shelter themselves, they'll just refuse to go back to work. Even though technically unemployment benefits get cut off if they refuse to take a job, but hey, does this look like the face of a man who didn't do his research? Or the face of Grandpa Munster dressing up as a Confederate general for Halloween, but it's at the last minute, so the fake beard is his pubes. It's both. It turns out that unemployment benefits won't affect employment rates because there are simply not enough jobs to be had. Gee, we weird to happen in the middle of a deadly pandemic. But yes, research shows that job vacancies declined at a rate three times faster than job applications, meaning that labor demand fell faster than labor supply. Economics. There is simply not enough jobs to go around right now. And in fact, cutting off unemployment benefits may imperil even more jobs because that relief money is getting spent on buying things, you know, like, 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 like food, necessities, and, and things to make life livable while stuck inside all day. Research has found that CARES Act unemployment relief actually increases spending for recipient households, which it turns out is actually important to support other jobs. Hey, remember all that jerking off about how important the economy is? And it's so important that we should kill millions of people off with COVID? Well, hey, if we give people spending money, that helps the economy too. Although I guess it is more fun in a sort of heavy metal way to just murder a bunch of people to get the economy going. So what happens when we don't give people financial relief during COVID? Well, we don't have to guess because it's happening now. As I mentioned earlier, 30 to 40 million are facing eviction. But to put a face to those statistics, here are some posts from the subreddit, sorry, unemployed. Here's a post from someone who spent their unemployment and relief money on rent and utilities, can't find a job, and so they're down to their last $18.91. This person says they now can't afford insulin and says that hopefully their inability to pay for food will at least help with their diabetes. They write, I never worried in my life about politics affecting me so personally, but here it is at my front door. Here's another post from someone in Kentucky who is out of work, can't get a job, isn't getting the back pay they're owed, and says their whole family will be out on the street soon. The poster begs readers to pray for them and to vote. There are many other posts similar to these from people who are down to their last few dollars who have been completely abandoned by their government, both locally and nationally, who don't know what to do. 
Sorry, there's no jokes in this section. I didn't think raw human misery could be punched up. But hey, if you stick with me, maybe I'll play a fart noise or make fun of how Ted Cruz's beard looks like a cat vomited up, again, his pubes. It really does. <laughs> so here we are. Millions and millions of people face poverty, hunger, and eviction because people like Ted Cruz think that being able to afford food and insulin will make them spoiled. And that means millions of people are about to become unhoused, homeless. To highlight how ridiculous it is to differentiate between people who deserve eviction and those who don't, here's a video of police eviction right now in Los Angeles. Yeah, I just wanted to know what was going on. We're doing an, an eviction. You're evicting someone? Uh, if there's anybody in there. Is that legal right now? Yes. Is it? In the middle of a pandemic? Well, we have about a thousand rents that we're enforcing, roughly, that were uh, granted prior to the governor's moratorium and have nothing to do with COVID. And we've had our county council review them and that's what we're doing. So from months ago, you're now evicting people? Yes. Okay, in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, if that's what you want to call it. I mean, uh, uh, if, 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 I mean, if that's what you want to call it, Mr. Smart Guy. So, so now we're calling an epidemic that is affecting countries pan globally a pandemic nerd. If you think it's strange that evictions are happening in LA, even though the eviction moratorium has not yet lifted, it turns out if you can't prove that the only reason you can't pay your rent is due to COVID, you're fair game to kick out on the street. And here's another real life news clip. It's just Star Trek accurately predicting mass homelessness in the context of, hey, wouldn't this be completely unthinkable if we just punished people who couldn't get jobs and couldn't pay rent? What do you think, noted Star Trek fan Ted Cruz, who thinks Captain Kirk is a Republican? Do you have something to say to the people being evicted? We are paying a whole lot of people a lot more money to stay home and not work than they made on their jobs. And, and, and that is terrible. Cool. Great. We, we have, we have fun here. We have, it's a great time. Can we play some kind of like, like, like a fun sound effect, like, like a fart noise, a slide whistle, a Tim Allen grunt. We are paying a whole lot of people a lot more money to stay home and not work. Now that's the well-crafted quality satire that keeps people coming back to the old Cody Shody. And here's some more news. And here's some crews. Last week was the anniversary of 9-11, which means it was also the anniversary of the day, 9-11, when United States Senator of Texas, Ted Cruz, liked a pornographic tweet depicting a woman who kind of looks like Ted Cruz's wife, who he once accidentally hit in the face right before accidentally elbowing her in the face, walking in on her stepdaughter getting railed by some guy. The woman, who kind of looks like Ted Cruz's wife, then proceeded to masturbate and ultimately join in with the happy couple. Upon everyone having quite a hoot at Ted Cruz's personal account liking this tweet on 9-11, Cruz blamed this activity on a staffing error and assured folks that the tweet has been reported to Twitter. Now, this is an odd response, partly because porn is allowed on Twitter. So, not sure what you're reporting there, the, the malicious tweet that you liked. Now, Ted's claim that multiple people have access to his account and it was an accidental like well, first of all, if true, maybe fire the guy who I'm pretty sure wants to f your wife. But also, if there are people with access to your account, and that's why they like the tweet, who are you following? How did that end up in your feed, Ted Cruz? Also, and this is important, it was definitely him who liked it. Because Ted Cruz lives on Twitter. I should know. So do I. Ted Cruz has two different Twitter accounts. His official senator account, send Ted Cruz, verified, and his personal account, the one that liked the porn on 9-11, Ted Cruz, also verified. His senator account is the one that would have staff tweeting for him. And all you need to do is look at his personal account's tweets, which we will, and you know, it, it's, it's him. Now, I could point out what a hypocrite Ted Cruz is, as if that would change anything, and mention that he once argued, legally, against the idea of masturbation to ban sex toys. And I quote, there is no substantive due process right to stimulate one's genitals for non-medical purposes unrelated to procreation or outside of an interpersonal relationship. Ah yes, the law. 
But this video isn't about Ted Cruz or his staff liking a porn tweet from his personal non-U.S. senator account on 9-11. This is about Ted Cruz's swift descent into being a weird little online freak who spends his time as a U.S. senator tweeting Daily Wire memes and challenging Alyssa Milano to debates. And the crux of the video, trolling college students until they make their accounts private. He, and congressmen like him, are trying to be the Trump-style culture warrior bullies of no substance. You know, the kind of thing that beat Ted Cruz into submission. Just toxic nonsense. Like how Trump said his wife is ugly and called him a pussy. Well, now Ted can get in on the action. For example, if Trevor Noah does a segment about how gender reveal parties are silly and could be seen as offensive since the child hasn't actually chosen their gender yet, Ted Cruz might, like a weird little online freak who forgets that he's a senator, quote tweet that by saying liberal males do tend to not grow balls. We could spend some time talking about how sex isn't the same thing as gender, or we could talk about the idea of Ted Cruz saying someone doesn't have any balls, but maybe we'll save that for the end. It's just a, a small example of Little Ted. Another great example of this evolution of the GOP into a bunch of weird little online freaks is from Trump sycophant and normal head haver Matt Gates. John Cryer of Two and a Half Men tweeted, Rep. Matt Gates invited a white supremacist to the State of the Union, attempted to intimidate a federal witness, and endorsed a sociopathic bigot who applauded the deaths of migrants for Congress. Now, in response to these true things that a normal congressperson might want to either explain or deny, Matt tweeted, Charlie Sheen carried two and a half men, utter nonsense, from a congressperson, in response to the fact that he invited a white supremacist to the State of the Union. Now, in response to this, instead of being like, why did you say that? Instead of responding to the accurate claims, John's ego got hurt, and so he talked about how many Emmys he won after Sheen left the show, so... Good shit all around, I guess. But this is the kind of thing our lawmakers spend their time on these days. Trying to be the Trump Twitter troll, just dunking on Bette Midler or whatever, instead of, you know, being a senator. The same week of the anniversary of Ted Cruz liking a porn tweet on the anniversary of 9-11, Donald Trump released his list of possible Supreme Court picks if he wins again. Ted Cruz was on that list. Now, there's a, a lot to unpack about that. For example, the original list that Donald Trump gave years ago for his potential Supreme Court picks didn't have Gorsuch or Kavanaugh on that list. So this is just a, a list of names. Also, Ted Cruz at that time pledged to keep the Supreme Court seat open for four years if Hillary won, because he's a vile worm. Also, pretty sure this was simply a favor to Ted because he had a book about the Supreme Court coming out. And so on the same day the list was released, Ted was like, buy my book. Also, Ted Cruz has since responded to this by saying that he's honored to be on the list because he really, he really, really cares about Donald Trump's opinion about him and his wife and so on. But he doesn't see himself on the Supreme Court. He wants to stay in the fight, in the Senate. That's what he sees himself spending years in the Senate, fighting the good fight. Now, this is extra interesting because one of the things that Ted Cruz and Donald Trump agree on as a team is that there should be term limits on Congress, not the worst idea. Donald Trump put this promise at the top of his list of promises in 2016. That promise remains on the 2020 platform for the GOP because he didn't do anything about it, despite the fact that Ted Cruz has written an amendment to limit terms in Congress. Of course, the amendment that Ted Cruz wrote doesn't include Congress people who have already exceeded those limits. So if you've been in Congress for like five terms, the limit to two terms wouldn't take effect until the next term, so you could get another term. Very clever, Ted. Clever boy. Anyway, that amendment was written and ready to go four years ago, but Ted didn't bring it up at all or try to pass it at all because Ted Cruz is a lying fraud worm who doesn't believe in much of anything. He, he, wants, he wants to be fighting the good fight in the Senate for years. That's where he sees himself. Also, there should be term limits for Congress, but also he's gonna be there for years fighting the good fight. 
Anyway, we could spend hours going balls deep into Ted Cruz's rich history of obvious hypocrisy and all the things he said about Donald Trump being horrible and how he pretends he didn't and that it's all good now and his record and his AstroTurf Tea Party movement and how he helped steal the 2000 election for George W. Bush and how he was openly disliked by everyone in politics regardless of party. And maybe we will do that when he's up for re-election, despite, you know, his view on term limits. But that's not what this is about. So instead, before the real point of this, here's just a, a quick rundown of some of his weird little freaky tweets. Like his tweets about f***ing Goya beans and how the left is trying to silence free speech by boycotting them, even though, you know, boycotts are a form of free speech. And also, the president that Ted Cruz loves tries to cancel Nike and, I don't know, f***ing Barbara Streisand twice a f***ing week. Weird that Ted Cruz, champion of free speech, has nothing to say about the president saying that if you burn the American flag, you should go to jail for a year. You burn the flag, you should go to jail for one year. I really mean that. Here's Ted Cruz challenging an actor to wrestle someone who isn't Ted Cruz. Here he is commenting, COMMUNISTS! on an article that suggests trying other foods on holidays. Ted has developed a habit of regularly retweeting Andy No, a blatant fraud and fascist propagandist who is such an obvious fraud that he pretended to have a fake British accent for several months. I've attended mandatory training on social justice in media, and I've been taught about um, factoring in um, power dynamics of people. Portland, Oregon is a extremely progressive city in the Pacific Northwest of the US. And um, I call it a political monoculture. Here he is retweeting videos of a swan pulling someone's mask on and calling the swan a goose. Here he is retweeting a lie about how Bank of America is donating $1 billion to Black Lives Matter, a thing they weren't doing. Here he is tweeting out Antifa.com, which links to a Joe Biden donation page. Thanks for the link, Ted. And he pretends as though he doesn't understand that it's an obvious troll website and Antifa and Joe Biden are completely not related. This makes sense though, considering free speech hero Ted Cruz wrote a law trying to label Antifa terrorists to stop them from protesting. And his law used Antifa and left-wing activism interchangeably because he's a fascist goon and he wants to blur the lines. It's a, it's a shame that environmentalism in America is exclusively seen as left-wing. Hope your law isn't used irresponsibly, Ted. You'd hate that. Here's Ted digging up a two-year-old tweet from Jim Acosta to say that people want to destroy Mount Rushmore, while also claiming that the protests are full of raping, murderous Antifa. Gonna need a link for those rapes, Ted. The raping Antifa, who you liken to left-wing activism and any Democrat. Here he is asking why anyone would elect these goofballs in Congress with masks on their faces, despite this existing. Here he is claiming that someone is defending child porn despite that person not doing that. Because again, he wants to blur the lines and has no concern about getting people murdered. Here he is posting about how some angry lefty actor thinks California is the only place that has summer. It's hot everywhere. Try Texas every summertime. But the rest of the country doesn't have such a dysfunctional state government that you can't turn the lights on or run AC. That's a policy failure of the Dems. Despite this article from a year earlier, almost to the day, which reads, The Energy Reliability Council of Texas appealed to all of the state's consumers of electric power to limit and reduce their usage during the peak demand hours of 3 to 7 p.m. Tuesday after reserve capacity fell below 2,300 megawatts. High temperatures have resulted in record electricity demand over the last few days and may result in a new record today, said Ericott President and CEO Bill Magnus. Consumers can help lower energy consumption by taking some simple actions between the hours of 3 and 7 p.m. While defending the claim that Trump is untouchable by the law, which, who boy, I mean, maybe, I don't know, Ted told Lawrence Tribe, Trump has broken you, which, funny stuff, Ted. Here's Ted Cruz retweeting a Muppet tweet about how love is love, you can love who you want, and claiming that it's about sex? A thing the 9-11 porn tweet liker loves to do. See, for the past few days, Ted Cruz has been obsessively tweeting about something on Netflix called Cuties, which is about how the sexual exploitation of young girls is bad, something I think we can all agree on. Now, some scenes and images from the movie are 
pretty gross and not something I'm going to show you. And I'm sure there's an actual reasonable conversation to be had about this. But Ted Cruz is using this as an opportunity to paint all lefties as pedophiles who support child porn, as seen earlier in that other tweet, despite that not being a thing that is happening. And despite the current president having an entire page in Jeffrey Epstein's little black book, images like this with his young daughter, bragging about walking into the changing room of teen beauty queens, more than one Trump campaign pain chair pleading guilty to charges of sex trafficking, the eight-year Republican Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert, being a convicted pedophile, Ted Cruz retweeting James Woods, who tried to pick up Amber Tamblyn when she was 16 and he knew she was 16, and Ted Cruz himself defending child molester Roy Moore. Also, decades of actual pageants of actual young girls doing this sh for real, a lot of them in Texas. But Ted Cruz doesn't care because it's a wormy little troll who can't log the f off. In response to people saying he's just throwing red meat to Trump's QAnon base, Ted is baffled by this, despite, you know, having retweeted a very popular QAnon account very recently. Now, these swans are geese and challenging a random actor to wrestle one of his colleagues for him tweets are all tweets that are still up. I haven't gotten to the deleted tweets, like him retweeting liar and known plagiarist Benny Johnson claiming that the gun-toting couple from that thing, you know the thing, how they were both BLM supporting Democrats, a thing that they are not. Because the real deleted tweets I'd like to get to are here. On a random night online back in January, when much of the country was asleep, Ted Cruz was busy being a weird little online freak and name searching himself. He found a single tweet from some young college student who tweeted about how you know you're in the wrong when Ted Cruz agrees with you. It was a quote tweet of a Ricky Gervais tweet about free speech. Now, the college student shared a screenshot of the tweet, did not tag Ted Cruz, and the tweet had gotten no more than six likes. But Ted Cruz was being busy, being a weird little online freak, and thus he found this tweet nine minutes later, and retweeted it to his hundreds of thousands of weirdo followers. After a few minutes of his followers harassing her, Ted tweeted, Weird. I affirmed and agreed with her right to express her lefty views, and she blocked me for saying that. This exchange sums up 2020 perfectly. Now, aside from the president blocking tons of people on Twitter, and also who cares, but also, she didn't block you, Ted. I mean, who would blame her? But what she did was make her account private because of all the harassment you directed at her. After someone pointed this out to him, or just after having a single thought for a f***ing second, Ted quietly deleted those tweets. Not a word, not an apology, not a mention after that night. And ultimately, I guess this isn't really important. I mean, it's stupid. He's stupid and vile and pathetic. But like, I don't know. Kind of wish someone would ask him about how he name searched himself and then harassed some random student for no reason and then doubled down and pretended not to know why she would make her account private and then deleted those tweets without a word and then continued down his path of being a weird little online freak. So I guess I actually agree with Ted on this. This exchange sums up 2020 perfectly. Much like Ted Cruz summed up 2016 perfectly. At the RNC in 2016, when it was expected that Ted Cruz would finally endorse Donald Trump, he went out and he told everybody in a Weasley way that would grant him plausible deniability to not vote for Donald Trump. He talked about what the party used to be and the, the great things that they were capable of. And then he said in November, Vote your conscience. Vote for Republicans up and down the ballot. He never said vote for Trump. He was telling people that Trump is bad and you should follow your conscience and not vote for him. Vote for Republicans down ballot, but don't vote for Donald Trump. Then he got booed and everybody saw it. Up and down the ticket who you trust to defend our freedom and to be faithful to the Constitution. And a short time after, we got this. 
a beautiful visual metaphor of a sweaty, desperate, ballless, and ovaryless Ted Cruz who had completed his transformation into a vile worm who would rather spend his time dunking on Alyssa Milano and calling swans geese instead of being a senator. We've talked a lot on this show about how Donald Trump didn't cause our problems. He's a symptom of many of our problems. He exacerbates our problems. But this perpetually online culture war bully shit, that's Trump, man. He did this. He broke Ted Cruz. Now, of course, Cruz was always a little worm on the inside, but who boy did Trump bring it out of him after beating him into submission and showing him that a true leader, a real patriot and representative spends his days quoting the Princess Bride and complaining about Goya fucking beans. What a dark world they must live in when Big Bird is seen as the political enemy. It just, it must be isolating for someone like Ted Cruz, supporter of the sex pest president and hater of masked vigilantes who do property damage and combat the police, to suddenly feel betrayed by The Princess Bride, a movie that was always about a sex pest leader taken down by a masked vigilante. Like, where does he think he fits in with that story? It's enough to make a person kind of resentful. You know, libs owned popular culture, and so they really want to own the libs. Trump's good to a lot of them because of spite. He's payback. Lindsey Graham, the guy who backed Trump's false claims of election fraud, shocked. Ted Cruz, the guy who actively alleged voter fraud despite there being no evidence of it, shocked. Trump's own White House staff, shocked. It kind of makes you wonder where they were for the past four years, how they appear to be, uh, just tuning in. Well, no matter, Republican lawmakers watching this video right now, while we can't keep up with what's happening right this moment, we might as well use our 100th episode to remind you of everything that got us here. Perhaps get us all on the same page. And for the people who were actually paying attention, maybe this can be therapeutic. We can be like, thankful, it's technically behind us, sort of, not really. Like if they actually go after Trump, which is the best case scenario, that means there will be a year long trial filled with protests and dumb lies and likely violence and terrible grifter takes and Twitter, oh, the Twitter. But again, technically speaking, we're done. We're done with the earwig for now. Aren't you happy? Also, this is gonna take forever if I spend this much time on every lie. So let's just shotgun a few of them, blast them into your face like you're a cornrow Jared Leto in David Fincher's panic room. Starting from the very beginning of his campaign. Some highlights. Lying nonstop about his campaign opponents and drumming up lasting conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton when there's plenty of real stuff to complain about. Saying that Obama wiretapped him because of a, uh, and I quote, little bit of a hunch. Or, much more hilariously, boosting a theory that Ted Cruz's father helped assassinate John F. Kennedy based on a story from the National Enquirer, triggering a newfound humiliation fetish in the senator and snowballing an apparent life of servitude. If blame was piss, hot piss, then we're filling a kiddie pool up and just really soaking it in. That's what the time is for. Now is the time for assigning blame and really rubbing that blame in and then calling for punishment and spite. Don't forget spite and feeling super smug because while yeah, there's some delicious piss blame to slather everywhere, very fine piss on both sides. This video is about all the weird little fascists who should but almost definitely won't be held accountable for their actions. Their quirky little insurrectionist actions. The ones who would constantly downplay the threat of Trump and Trumpism and are even now claiming that now that Trump is out of office, he and his office of the former president are going to call Calm down. Like he hasn't exposed and spawned so many mini versions of himself. Those people were wrong and are wrong and will continue to be wrong and will never admit to being wrong about how Trump not only didn't calm down, but he actively worked to destroy the country. He was divisive, petty, mean, greedy, criminal, and incompetent. And now everyone knows that. It's undeniable. Bask in this, I guess, in being right. 
We're Ian Malcolm gloating in the helicopter as it flies away from Jurassic Park. Only instead of dinosaurs on the loose, it's a bunch of racist truthers somehow holding office despite claiming that wildfires are caused by Jewish lasers. We had witnessed 9-11, uh, the terrorist attack um, in New York, and the plane that uh, crashed in Pennsylvania, and the so-called plane that crashed into the Pentagon. It's odd, there's never any evidence shown for a plane in the Pentagon. But anyways, I won't, I'm not gonna dive into the 9-11 conspiracy. Ah, but the far left want free healthcare, so they're the same, equal on both sides, you see. Anyway, we're certainly going to talk about that person later, that lady who wants like Democrat politicians and voters to literally be murdered, I think. My point at the moment though, is that she's a direct result of Donald Trump becoming president. One of the dinosaurs on the loose, still at large. That's pretty important to keep in mind here, that the damage is still being done. And if anyone tries to act like we need to move on now, that he's no longer president and not do anything besides stop and say, hey, wait, a lot of people need to go to jail or like not be in the government anymore. Then that person is either in extreme denial a foolish person, or one of the people that needs to go to jail, or all three combined, also known as Ted Cruz. You know, Joe Biden last week at his inauguration gave this impassioned plea for unity, and congressional Democrats, their first response is, great, let's spend the first month of the Biden administration impeaching Donald Trump. They just hate Trump, and, it, and it's for them, their partisan hatred is a higher priority than actually working for the people of this country than doing something about the global pandemic we face than then then helping the tens of millions of people out of work actually get back to work and helping businesses reopen hey ted guess what don't worry there will be another big stimulus bill coming up vote for it vote for it ted or i guess add to the pile more evidence that you're a complete fraud anyway you're right it's true we just we just, we just hate this Donald Trump for no reason other than partisan anger. Who can even say why we're mad at him in the first place? You know, it's like, it's like, it's like, geez. You get so wrapped up in something, you forget why you're doing it in the first place. All of this anger and not getting anything done. Such a, a shame we can't, as a nation, do multiple things at once. So we should probably just Move on and focus on the other problems, like this pandemic that went grotesquely out of hand for some reason. Probably not important why. And wow, geez, it's weird. There's a lot of other problems in the country too. I wonder what's happened in the last few years. Point is that we need to push aside our illogical hatred of Donald Trump and work to solve all of these many crises that for some reason exist now. No more partisan squabbling or pettiness. No more wasting time, says Ted Cruz, the senator of a state in a country currently having a Twitter war with Seth Rogen and talking about how environmentalists are like Thanos. I guess Ted's a big Dave Rubin and Tim Pool fan. You, you watch the, the, the Avengers, right? The Avengers mm -hmm. movies, you watch some of them. So, you know, Thanos basically was Bernie. Yeah, so, so for instance, like Thanos was, the, was utilitarian and Captain America was deontological. Have you noticed in how many movies, how often rabid environmentalists are the bad guys? Hmm. Whether it's Thanos or, or go to Watchmen. Cool stuff, Senator. Hey, Ted, you know how you reached out to AOC to work on some kind of Wall Street or tech regulation after the whole GameStop thing? And she was like, no, Ted. Remember the whole coup thing, Ted? And now you can be like, see, the, the left is so full of hatred. They won't even come to the table on something they agree with. The GOP is the true party of the working class. But the thing is, Ted, nothing's stopping you from writing up anything. That tweet from AOC doesn't mean you can't. Go ahead, buddy, write it. Stop virtue signaling. I look forward to seeing your Wall Street big tech legislation, former Google lobbyist who's, according to Donald Trump, hideous wife is a managing director at Goldman Sachs. But anyway, now is the time for unity and healing. According to the people causing the injury, just to go back to that Jurassic Park analogy, calls for unity from the GOP are kind of like calls for unity by a velociraptor as it's eating you.
Why are you still talking about these dinosaurs on the loose? They'd screech through bites of your pulpy flesh. Now is the time to think about branching the divide between man and prehistoric monster, or did you not actually care about unity? Screech, screech, I say. Hook claw to you, sir. Also, Alan. And really, if we want this analogy to keep going, we do. If the Velociraptors are complaining about unity, they can actually unify with the humans and the T-Rex to take down the big guy, the Indominus Rex from the best Jurassic Park, the World One. And see, here's the thing about unity or healing. We actually have a pretty clear idea of what that means in terms of the criminal justice system. Like, while the idea of closure for victims is often used as a very bad justification for capital punishment, most papers on the matter agree that there is a healing process that will accelerate when a perpetrator is convicted for their crimes and taken off the streets. It gives the victim the ability to move on knowing that person won't harm anyone else. But it's not just that, because our criminal justice system isn't about helping victims, not really. It's actually more about setting lines that people can't cross in order to have a working society. Also, jailing black teens for small amounts of weed? But that's another video subject. I'm not advocating for our justice system, folks. I'm just saying that this is how, like, accountability works, or at least is supposed to work, in the eyes of our government. A crime gets committed, often creating victims of that crime, and our legal system is there to punish the people who did that crime in order to ensure that more people don't keep doing crimes. And hopefully by doing that, the victims can see some kind of closure or healing. And while that system might have a lot of flaws, it's the same standard we're, in theory, but super not actually, holding everyone to. Certainly the party of law and order can agree that this is how it works, right? And on January 6th, 2021, Crimes were committed. Crimes that we're currently impeaching the former president for, as well as holding a bunch of people in custody for. But the problem is that not all of the people who did the crime are in jail. And in fact, many of them, let's call them motherfuckers, are currently holding and will likely continue to hold government positions while talking about unity and healing. A thing we can't actually achieve because, well, that thing I just said, where they're not in jail. The last four years have been undeniably divisive, and if there's any hope of fixing that, it begins with making sure the right people actually get punished. Heal by punishing somebody. Unify around taking down the dinosaur together. So before my home is raided by a joyful puppet who I now regret giving my spare key to, let's name some of these motherfuckers. The motherfuckers who need to be punished. Hey, did someone say Ted Cruz just now? Like, like, like just now, a sentence ago? Oh right, it was me when I said, did someone say Ted Cruz? That's who said it. Yeah, we should probably talk about this Ted Cruz fellow. You know, the weird little Twitter creep, patsy to dumb president, jacker of 9-11 pornography and wife elbower. Hated by strangers and personal family alike. Bipartisanly hated by his colleagues. It sure seems like he did a sedition or two. And besides, you know, Trump is probably the best person to start with. Because from the moment Trump lied about election fraud, little Ted was right there to back him up. Well, Sean, what we're saying tonight, what we've been saying the last three days is outrageous. It is partisan, it is political, and it is lawless. And, and, and we're seeing this pattern in Democratic city after Democratic city, but the worst in the country right now is Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where they're, they're not allowing the election observers in, despite clear state law that requires election observers being there, despite an order from a state judge saying ele election observers have to be within six feet of the ballot counting. They're just ignoring the law. They're defying the law. And there's a reason they're doing that. There's a reason they're defying the law. The reason you don't want observers there is because you're doing something you don't want to be observed. And, and I am angry, and I think the American people are angry because by throwing the observers out, by clouding the vote counting in a shroud of darkness, they are setting the stage to potentially steal an election, not just from the president, but from the, the, the over 60 million people across this country who voted for him 
all across this country. It is lawless and they need to follow the law. Sorry, I don't normally want to inflict so much Ted Cruz on you, but it's important to hear exactly what he said in that Fox interview on November 5th and that it was on November 5th specifically, because that's the same day that Trump's lawyers admitted that they actually had representatives in the room watching the count. Meanwhile, on CNN, the Republican city commissioner was confirming the exact same thing. You are a Republican. You have been there every single day. You actually helped out with how this would all work. Give us the truth, please, Commissioner. Well, my party affiliation doesn't and shouldn't affect what's, what's true and what is not true. Uh, observers from the Democratic Party and Republican Party from the Biden campaign and the Trump campaign have been in our counting area observing right up against where the process is taking place from the very beginning on election morning when, the, when we began this. So we have Ted Cruz, a uh, lion Ted, if you will, repeating President Trump's lie, literally the exact same time that Trump's lawyers were admitting he was lying. And like, I don't know, maybe Ted didn't know this at the time and was simply making his impassioned incriminating speech based on a few rumors he heard, because that's definitely how you should govern. Anywho, by November 17th, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court officially threw out this case. And it had been made pretty clear that there was simply no substantial voter fraud nationwide. But that didn't stop Ted from tweeting this random and disjointed quote from the 2005 Commission on Federal Election Reform saying, absentee ballots remain the largest source of potential voter fraud. As if this single sentence from a 100 page report somehow meant something? If you actually went to that section of this report, you'd find that they are talking about future potential of absentee ballots and have no actual evidence of this happening in a widespread capacity and cite anecdotal stories like a 1998 mayoral election where fake names and dead people were used. Something that isn't a problem on a federal level as far as we know. And this is how Ted continued to operate tweeting out disjointed quotes from studies about voter fraud, finding isolated stories like this one about how someone submitted voter registration applications while claiming that is proof voter fraud does exist, see? But like, no one is disputing that, Ted. Voter fraud isn't fucking Bigfoot. The question was whether or not it affected this election, which it didn't. And Ted, a guy who clearly cares so much about election integrity knows this. The point isn't to actually prove voter fraud for the current election, but rather to rile up enough fear of fraud that people feel like they are under attack. It's actually a very familiar technique of the GOP. See Mexicans, comma, rapists. What? Well, most, of course. Most Mexicans. Some, assumingly, aren't. So by the time this got to the actual electoral college vote count, Ted Cruz had absolutely no evidence of fraud. He wanted to delay the count by 10 days, or at least make some kind of weird last stand. And like a terrifying clown who forgot his party kit, just juggled whatever sad crap he had on him. Recent polling shows that 39% of Americans believe the election that just occurred, quote, was rigged. You may not agree with that assessment, but it is nonetheless a reality for nearly half the country. I would note it is not just Republicans who believe that. 31% of independents agree with that statement. 17% of Democrats believe the election was rigged. Even if you do not share that conviction, it is the responsibility, I believe, of this office to acknowledge that is a profound threat to this country and to the legitimacy of any administrations that will come in the future. He argued that since so many Americans falsely believe the election is fake, they should humor them with an investigation. Hey, good idea, Ted. Let's investigate all the things a large percentage of Americans believe. But putting aside the absurdity of this argument or the fact that the only reason Americans would believe the election was a fraud is because people like Ted lied about it, 
Well, let's look at the study he is citing. Here it is again on his official press release. And here's the actual Reuters Ipsos study, which turns out to be of only 1,346 people. And when Ted said that 17% of Democrats, quote, believe the election was rigged, he's talking about this top section here, in which 17% of Dems either strongly or somewhat agreed to the statement, I am concerned that the election is rigged. Note the word concerned, and how maybe that doesn't mean those respondents believed the election was rigged. Oh, also, the polling company came out and flat out said that Ted Cruz was misusing that question. And if you actually just, you know, look down a little bit, just lazily let your eyes drift downward, you'll find on the same page, the much more direct question what comes close to your view of the 2020 election, where respondents were actually given the chance to specifically say it was rigged, and only 6% of Democrats and 20% of independents did that, of this one poll of 1,356 people. So, yeah, Ted is lying. A lion Ted. And he knows he's lying. The proof that he's lying is literally on the same page as the study he's using to lie. Not to mention that literally every election is seen as a fraud by some percentage of Americans, specifically the losing side. That's actually a normal thing that happens. The not normal thing being when politicians who know that's normal somehow decide to feed that lie. So his claim that there's some unprecedented doubt in the election based on this survey is a lie. And it's literally the only reason he has for holding up the vote count. This lie being made by Ted Cruz for the purpose of delaying the election, or to put it in legal terms, Someone using official authority for the purpose of interfering with or affecting the nomination or the election of any candidate for the office of president. Which, hey, is a crime it turns out. One punishable by up to a year in prison. Oh man, can you picture it? Prison Ted Cruz creeping out all the other inmates, getting picked last for prison polo because it's a rich white guy prison. And that's just election interference, a thing he definitely did. If we want to get him on a betting sedition, it might be a bit harder, despite that being a thing he definitely also did. Along with these fine f**ks, you know the f**ks. See, these are the 147 Republican officials who, after the U.S. Capitol was attacked, reconvened and then continued to vote in favor of objections to Joe Biden becoming the president. Meaning that they were evacuated, had their lives threatened by Stop the Steel rioters breaking in, and then came back to count the votes. And while several other empty objections were being thrown out because the GOP had literally zero factual reasons to halt the process, some people still voiced objections after all of that. And these are the people who voted on the objections based on zero actual reasons after they were attacked by people trying to stop the election. Like, they literally gave no reasons for the objections. They did it just to hold up or interfere with the election. And so, just going by, you know, the law, they should all be charged. Or, I guess, have their political donations cut off for, like, a little while. That, that's, that's fine, too. That'll teach them. What a great day for democracy when the only justice comes from mega corporations. Hey, maybe if the impeachment thing doesn't work out, Trump can at least be thrown into one of those Pirates of the Caribbean cells. Like, super cool that Lindsey Graham feels kind of bad about the whole violent coup stuff. But perhaps... He should be in jail instead. And I'm not saying that just out of anger or dislike or what have you, but because according to Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, Lindsey Graham asked him if he was able to throw out all mail-in ballots in counties that had signature issues in only a few of their ballots. Meaning that Lindsey Graham got in contact with Raffensperger repeated a bunch of election lies, and then asked him to throw out legal ballots, which is, according to several Georgia election law experts, a felony. One punishable by up to five years in prison. And so perhaps 
we should continue to look into that and whether or not what Raffensperger is saying is actually true and whether or not Lindsey Graham should be a prisoner instead of a senator. I could do a whole video on Lindsey, but there are just so many VIP jizz swimmers that need a shout out, like Representative Paul Gosar, seen here not pulling off bangs, who teamed up with Ted Cruz for that whole try to stop a fair election biz. But unlike Ted, our new buddy Paul isn't nearly as able to wash his hands of the whole armed insurrection thing. Um, we did a meetings uh, a couple of years ago where our elected representative from Washington, Paul Gosar, came out and we asked him flat out at that time, uh, do you think we're heading into a civil war? And his response to the group was just flat out, we're in it. We just haven't started shooting at each other yet. That's Jim Arroyo from the Oath Keepers describing an interaction with Paul Gosar where he told them that they were literally in the middle of a civil f***ing war. That video is from November of 2020, just a few months before several Oath Keepers attempted to do a planned coup along with several Proud Boys, a fascist street gang. Like, I know you know that, but it's important to really hammer home how the dog whistling is now just screaming the things. Dog screaming? And going back to that Ian Malcolm Jurassic Park analogy, it's important to recognize this as an objective fact before we show you this picture of Paul Gosar posing with some Proud Boys back in July. Bangs are looking slightly better there, Paul. Nice job. Now, sure, Paul could probably say something about how he doesn't remember his Oath Keeper conversation or didn't know who the Proud Boy was, but to quote Ted Cruz, we're talking about a terrorist attack by multiple extremist groups. They are domestic terrorists, groups that were classified as such long before Paul Gosar was taking pictures with them. And while they failed their zip tie insurrection on the Capitol, the seriousness of what they were attempting can't be understated. They were there to kidnap and kill democratic politicians for the purposes of overthrowing an election. And they were aided by extremist groups like the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys who have been for months screaming about doing exactly this. And while there's like countless articles breaking down the many lies he's made or the many false claims he's retweeted. For some reason, this mother just published a book of more lies and typos and testified before Congress. Thank you, Chairman Cruz, Ranking Member Hirono, and members of the committee. Antifa is not a myth. While wearing his best fake British accent too. It's fake. The accent is fake. He's a fraud. It's a fake accent. This pathological liar and weirdo was invited by Ted Cruz, another weirdo and liar, to talk about the Antifa menace back in August, roughly six months before the US Capitol was violently attacked by, uh, not Antifa. In fact, they were so not Antifa that they were actually the people Antifa opposes, also known as the, um, Fa. Jeez, it's, it's almost like this whole time there was an uptick in white supremacist extremist violence and instead of addressing it, politicians focused on the counter protesters to those groups. And a lot of people like Andy No spent their careers aiding those extremists by unfairly labeling Antifa as the real problem. And maybe we now need to recognize that and never, ever, 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 ever listen to the grifters who tried to tell us that right-wing violence wasn't an issue and investigate whether or not they knew at the time they were lying about the threat of Antifa being somehow worse than all the Nazi militias brewing in this country and dig into their associations with these terrorists. You know that whole trope where humanity finally decides on world peace when faced with an alien invasion? Like, it would take some kind of malevolent force that targets all of humanity for us all to come together and defend our existence. Well, in reality, if malevolent aliens came to invade Earth, we would spend most of our time debating their existence while Ted Cruz retweets an I identify as the aliens headline from the Babylon Bee and the rest of our time watching various CEOs offer automated delivery services of human brains to the aliens using DoorDash drivers who also get eaten by the aliens. Hi folks, there's a, <clears throat> there's a crisis at the border. It's gone absolutely tits up and we're all basically f***ed. The Biden administration continues to face growing scrutiny over its handling of the migrant surge at our southern border. We are witnessing what is an unmitigated disaster at our southern border and you will pay the full price. Lawless chaos on our southern border. Wow. 
That sounds super serious. I'm sure all of this panic is based on facts and research. I mean, there's no way that Ted Cruz would cosplay as Han Solo and stand in a bunch of reeds to pretend like he's tracking down smugglers just to get political attention, right? We're at the edge of the river. On the other side of the river is Mexico. On the other side of the river we have been listening to and seeing cartel members. Wow, the cartels are right behind you, Ted. That seems really dangerous. Can we see these cartels you say are right behind you? No, there's no footage of the cartels right behind you? Oh gosh, golly darn and shoot. But I'm sure all of those cartels are right there laughing at us right out of frame. But Ted Cruz isn't the only one with exclusive dramatic footage of the border calamity. CNN seems to have fallen for a staged border crossing. According to the American Prospect and The Guardian, footage that CNN and Breitbart purported to be of a migrant boat crossing seems likely to have been staged, potentially by Border Patrol. The problem with the footage that border activists and journalists point out is that it occurs in an area of the Rio Grande that is so heavily monitored and patrolled, it would be almost impossible for a mass migrant crossing to go undetected by Border Patrol. Furthermore, the behavior of these smugglers doesn't add up. In the CNN footage, the smuggler was dressed in a black balaclava and fatigues, a behavior that The Guardian points out is unusual, given that most smugglers dress similarly to migrants so they won't be instantly clocked as the smuggler and face harsher punishment. Also, in a fun little slip-up, there's a conversation heard behind the camera where two men can be heard saying, do you ever hook these guys up? The other responding, yeah, two or three of them, they're grade A. According to former Border Patrol Jen Budd, as a former agent, what I hear is these men possibly talking about paying this smuggler off to gather a bunch of unsuspecting migrants and have them cross in a particular place in order to get this shot. So hey, it's, it's like an episode of Punked, except Ashton Kutcher is playing with human lives just to get good footage. So there really is a border crisis, but it's a humanitarian crisis as a direct result of our own anti-immigration policy. What do we do about it? Well, according to Trump, we're simply too full. And according to Biden, don't come here. And according to our current Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, now is not the time to come to the border. And while there's often hand-wringing about the humanitarian crisis... We've got 15,000 kids in federal government custody. This is a humanitarian crisis. We're simply too full to help out. As Ted Cruz writes in a Fox News op-ed, Texas is being overwhelmed by the magnitude of illegal immigrants flooding into small communities. So basically... Too bad, so sad, nothing we can do about it, country's full. Which is weird, because conservatives keep wanting us to have more babies, even though there's clearly no more room for those babies. That's, that's weird. But are we really too full to be able to accept more immigrants? Boy, did the Republican Party f***ing zero in on that one. Yes, conservatives have turned the phrase cancel culture into the scariest two words in the English language besides mayonnaise candy, and it is all in service of the most elaborate grift known to man. The right likes to shout cancel culture because they can't actually explicitly address the purported transgressions of values, usually the value of anti-bigotry. Take the exhausting Dr. Seuss debacle, and yes, that's how it's pronounced, do not cancel me. Dr. Seuss's estate decided to discontinue some of his books due to some insensitive racial stereotypes. This wasn't at the request or demand of the woke mob or the Democrats. It was just a decision that his estate made. Now, I don't necessarily agree with just not publishing the books anymore. Something like the Muppets disclaimer could work. Replacing the offending illustration with something better and an explanation. I don't know, but it was their decision. I'm pointing to this because it's a perfect example of using cancel culture to mask the actual issue. No Republican actually ever referenced the images from the Soyce books. Ted Cruz fundraised off it by selling signed copies of Green Eggs and Ham, a book that is still available for purchase and was not one of the pulled books in question. He and they had to keep referencing Green Eggs and Ham because they couldn't look at the racist stereotypes and say, that's good, I like it. They had to obfuscate it by saying, the left wants to cancel Dr. Seuss. Peppered in with that harassment is the actual legitimate criticism, but they're conflated and happen simultaneously. So which ones do people focus on? Which ones negatively affect people more and stick with them? 
This lets freaks and culture war weirdos like Ted Cruz conflate that with his stupid bullshit, pretending to care about the little guy and the woke mob when really he just wants to make a quick buck off of green eggs and ham. It muddies this entire conversation, rendering it pointless, meaningless, and silly. But also, if you're going to have it, it requires nuance that nobody is actually willing to engage in. Because as my best friend Michael Knowles and I have mentioned, this is just society. Societies have values, and they are dependent on many, many things. Certain values are shunned, others are encouraged. The question is, what are those values, and what should the consequences be? And so thank God Ted Cruz is here to stand up against um, a single advertisement. This is the story of a soldier who operates your nation's Patriot Missile Defense Systems. It begins in California with a little girl raised by two moms. The ad in question highlights a woman who was raised by two moms and joined the U.S. Army, and it's clearly part of a larger, if not cynical, attempt by our government to reach a more diverse crowd of younger people. Because younger people tend to be more inclusive, and the Army wants a young, diverse pool of recruits, because right now they really don't have that. Like, putting aside your views of the military, their lack of diversity and attractiveness to the youth is a problem they are experiencing. Because young people are better than us at seeing why the military is bullshit and also murder, apparently. I, unless it's like a, a fancy murder mystery where someone poisons Sir Michael Gambon. Then you gotta watch out for the olds. But you get the point. If you were trying to make an army of people to, like do computer stuff and fly planes and murder other people, and you don't have an army of mysterious clones to recruit, then you gotta get young people. It goes clones of bounty hunters on the top, then young people after that in terms of ideal military personnel. Unless it's fancy British parties, and then, once again, it's the olds. This got way far away from me. Okay, the point is that the military is struggling for recruits. Maybe because 18-year-olds are younger than one of our wars. And in addition to exploiting the poor for recruitment, they're also trying to get young and diverse crowds by appealing to what some might derisively refer to as wokeness. So if you were a uh, Republican senator from Texas, then perhaps it's not good to tweet about how the U.S. Army isn't as badass as the Russian Army based on a single piece of their propaganda. It seems like you're undermining your own country, which, hey, bully for you, to be clear. But I don't know, just a thought, Ted. I'm not really a fan of the military myself, but I'm guessing that Ted is... Ted, who, back in 2016, spoke of rebuilding the military. Again, a Republican senator who is pro-army, suddenly becoming anti-army the moment it gets woke. And by woke, we just mean diverse. Ted is pro-army so long as that army isn't diverse, apparently. You know, like a clone army of Maggie Smiths. That sounds f***ing wild. I will create a grand clone army of the Republic. I mean, that's really what we're talking about here, right? Not the clone army. But when Ted talks about the dangers of wokeness, he's just mad that gay people are in the military because he doesn't particularly like LGBTQ people or women in the military. But he can't just say that anymore because time has shown that to not be a pressing issue. This problem with wokeness, this obsession with it, is about something that isn't actually a tangible problem and is in fact a totally fake problem. LGBTQ people haven't destroyed the military the same way allowing women soldiers didn't. You know, except for how gay soldiers have to deal with harassment and there's a major sexual assault problem. Weird idea. Perhaps we should be talking about that. You know, 
an actual issue in the military that even our buddy Ted Cruz has put effort into trying to prevent because it's bad. Weird how it seems like even a few years ago, even the most embarrassing of Republicans wouldn't spend this much time pandering to weird Gamergate grudges on the internet. Y you noticed that, right? How back in like 2015 or 2016, Ted Cruz, while still a weirdo creep, would never really entertain these woke culture bullshit complaints. And now that seems like all he and a lot of the GOP like to talk about. And when NBC News flat out asked GOP senators what wokeness actually was, like, define wokeness, their answers varied wildly, as if perhaps no one was even sure what they were upset about or how it was a tangible problem. Because it sure seems like the term wokeness has simply replaced the post 9-11 word terror in that it's a vague boogeyman buzzword that allows Republicans to fire up their base and justify crushing measures aimed at brown people. It's just, you know, it's racism and bigotry. The old hits repackaged. And the same way Ted Cruz will prioritize anti-wokeness over seemingly conservative ideas like supporting the troops, this new stance can really short circuit them when they talk about corporations. You know how a private business has the right not to make wedding cakes for gay marriages, but also Twitter is censoring free speech by deplatforming Trump. Corporate cancel culture is bad and people shouldn't be fired for their beliefs unless their beliefs that conservatives don't like and et cetera and so forth. Hypocrisy is definitely on both sides with this stuff. There's no denying that. But the framing of Republicans as a working class party is particularly insulting when it comes to things like the minimum wage and student loans, not having healthcare tied to employment, lots of stuff beyond owning the libs. Although to be fair, Marco Rubio would like to put a one-year pause on student loan payments for victims of terror attacks. So, thank you, Marco, for that. And like, if you recall, there was a time when the GOP loved corporations. They're people, remember? But those people got all woke, it seems. And now we get this hilarious balancing act where GOP politicians are refusing to pack money from big corporations, not because it's the right thing to do, but because of wokeness. Evil, scary wokeness. But also, we'll still take that money, thank you very much. So, my warning, if you will, to corporate America is to stay out of politics. It's not what you're designed for. I'm not talking about political contributions. Most of them contribute to both sides. They have political action committees. That's fine. It's legal. It's appropriate. I support that. Extremely funny and transparent. Hey, Ted, now that you're the party of the working class, how about you tweet about reversing Citizens United? Do you remember that, Ted? When the 2010 Supreme Court decided that corporations are people who can use their free speech to spend all their sweet, sweet dollar signs on elections? If you're here for the working class and not rich folk, Ted, then certainly you're against that, right, Ted? Oh, it looks like you aren't and in fact have fought to not reverse that decision. Decision. Any comment? And I think the most significant political change of the last decade has been that the heart and soul of the Republican Party, we are a working class party now. We are a blue collar party. That's what we should have been and that's what we are. Ah yes, blue collar party. Except for not wanting to raise the minimum wage, not repeal Citizens United, not cancel student debt, not tax the wealthy. Did I miss anything? Oh right, he doesn't like unions either. Oh, he also voted no on a resolution for paid family leave for federal employees. But sure, Ted, you're a real working class hero. You know, because of the beard you grew, sorry, glued on, because what it actually comes down to, as you probably realized, is that the GOP is fine with corporations making donations or f***ing over their employees or doing literally anything they want, so long as they don't tweet Black Lives Matter or boycott states over voting rights. But if they dare do that, they will literally turn into f***ing Ralph Nader to stop them. It's, um... It's weird. It's just, you know, more weird grandstanding, very little actual work, you know? Which is why I qualified this section with 
and other fake problems. Because along with wokeness, boy, are the GOP taking a brave stand against vaccine passports, despite that not being a thing. Just this month, Senator Rick Scott has boldly introduced the Freedom to Fly Act, a measure prohibiting the US from requiring proof of vaccination for domestic passengers. To quote his heroic press release, my Freedom to Fly Act ensures families in Florida and across the country can travel freely and without the ridiculous government bureaucracy created by vaccine passports. Thanks, Rick. I'm sure that took a lot of time and hard work to get together. And in other news, the US has ruled out requiring any form of vaccine passport as of two months before Rick Scott's anti-passport act. Oh, hey, that's interesting how the Biden administration has said multiple times that there are zero plans for a vaccine passport, specifically pointing out that it would violate privacy rights. And then the GOP just kept talking about vaccine passports as if it's a thing Biden wants. It should be your personal choice. You should make the choice based on your health, based on the decisions you want. And, and so I've introduced this week legislation that would, number one, prohibit any federal vaccine passport, prohibit the Biden administration from doing anything to mandate vaccines. Thanks, Ted. Everyone has literally agreed about this for months now, but I'm glad you're fighting the Biden administration about requiring vaccines, a thing they specifically said they weren't going to do back in December. Great work, great use of everybody's time. I really can't stress this enough. The entire bill and the fight around it, creating retaliatory bills against companies protesting Georgia, all that bullshit is based on the claim of protecting us from a threat that doesn't actually exist. Not in Texas, not in America. And we know this, and they know this, but gosh darn it, it's not enough to have the Electoral College or even gerrymandering anymore. The GOP has to, in order to survive, flat out deny elections, or as they're now calling it, audit it. I know I may be a crisp young news dude and his 30s, but I'm old enough to remember the frenzied outrage over the national debt the Republicans unleashed during the Obama years. Obama was so afraid of these attacks from these deficit hawks and or bought into their worldview that he scaled down the stimulus bill following the Great Recession to ensure it wasn't too big, which ended up being a huge mistake that made the recovery from the Great Recession last much longer than it needed to. And even still, the Tea Party movement formed in opposition to the supposedly out of control government spending, allegedly, and dominated American politics for years, giving us gems like Rand Paul and Ted Cruz, who have haunted our nightmares ever since. Freedom! The fact is that austerity and systemic racism need to be tackled simultaneously. Otherwise, our politics are destined for an endless game of whack-a-mole because austerity politics and anti-black racism in America have a symbiotic relationship. White supremacy will constantly find new ways to reinvent itself, and the wealthy ruling class will always find ways to leverage racism for their own selfish goals. And this dynamic hurts everyone. And now is your opportunity, Joe! Pass your agenda you allegedly want to pass, while the Republican opposition is either hyper fixated on the supposed dangers of wokeness or are literally asleep. Here's a photo taken at a protest against school integration in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1959 of a little white boy holding a sign that reads, race mixing is communism. And here's the modern day version of Senator Joseph McCarthy, Senator Rafael Edward Cruz on his podcast in 2021. Yes, this Senator has a podcast talking with none other than Christopher Rufo using the exact same red scare playbook. All of this originated in Marxism What's interesting is it didn't just originate in Marxism. The end point that this curriculum is designed to teach the kids to go to is Marxism itself. It is designed to tear down capitalism and replace it with communism, replace it with Marxism, at, with, with government power, although on racial lines. I mean, is, that, is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I, I think it is. In fact, critical race theory, as these people present it, is just the newest iteration of the anti-Semitic trope of cultural Marxism, but with a little more mainstream appeal because anti-blackness has a bit more oomph in the context of America. Who do we blame for everything that happened in Afghanistan? Well, naturally, when figuring that out, we'll turn to the one group that definitely shares no blame and can freely criticize US policy the GOP. What we have seen is an incredible 
incredibly poorly executed exit from the theater, and it is endangering the lives. Thousands of Americans remain in Afghanistan. It appears the administration had no reasonable plan to safely allow those Americans to leave. Thousands of Afghans aided and assisted our military presence for decades, and it appears that the administration had little to no plan to help those Afghans exit the country as well. And, and, and this, this is a, a military failure, a failure in planning, a failure in execution that falls squarely on the president. And, and sadly, at least so far, it seems the president is trying to blame everyone except himself and his own administration. Thanks, Ted. Enjoy getting ratioed by lame CNN, you weird lying weirdo. Congratulations on using this historic moment to harass a woman online. Weirdo freak, freak liar. Weirdo Ted is now calling for an investigation into everything that's happened this month. And while that's probably more because of the right's deep sexual lust to have their own gotcha impeachment like the other team did twice with that terrible president that they didn't even like, he's also, I guess, not wrong about needing an investigation, but also not the type of investigation he probably plans on having where they lay a 20 year war started by George Bush and a 2002 Congress on Joe Biden. But also Joe Biden was one of those people in 2002 who voted for this 20 year war. And also he absolutely could have worked toward a smoother transition. In February, a sudden spike in energy demand brought about by winter storm Uri strained our power grid so badly, millions of Americans lost power. While Ted Cruz took a break from his border patrol cosplay to do happy man on vacation with his loving family cosplay, 4.2 million Texans were affected and President Biden declared a state of emergency. This law is just so blatantly malicious and gross to the point that even if you were pro-life, you should still find it to be a bad law that opens the doors to a flood of frivolous lawsuits, something I sure thought Republicans didn't like. You know, I have to say to Mr. Trump, you have been threatening frivolous lawsuits for your entire adult life, even in the annals of frivolous lawsuits, this takes the cake. Hey, Ted Cruz, do you remember when you made fun of Trump for filing frivolous lawsuits against you? How did that go for you? Ted and a lot of Texas Republicans have actually been pretty silent about this law, and that probably has to do with the fact that it's extremely hypocritical regarding how they're supposed to feel about frivolous legal proceedings. Not that these freaks care about hypocrisy or even pay a cost because of it, but they literally passed something called the Lawsuit Abuse Reduction Act in 2017. And suddenly they're like, super cool with it for this one thing. What I'm describing here reflects a key subset of gop ghouls that only became major names once Trump took office, and they come from two separate generations. The first being the likes of DeSantis and Chris Christie and Ted Cre Ted Cruz, who got their start during Obama's presidency and had to shift course once 2016 hit. The second being the newer group seemingly birthed from Trump's popularity and success. They both have some crucial things in common, but it sure seems like the latter group is way more fascinating. Most of them came from a place of entitlement, ran completely on culture war and conspiracy theories, and appear to be riddled with absolutely unreal scandals. The common thing across the board here is that all of these people base their political careers on being extremely reactive. It's not about governing the people, but maintaining an opposition to the left. You can see this with DeSantis and Ted Cruz's Obama years, most of their actions simply being to repeal stuff the president was doing. This was positively vital to their careers, as evidenced by the time Chris Christie dared to credit Obama for his swift response during Hurricane Sandy and became a fucking pariah in his own party. You could, I guess, argue that we'd see the same reaction if a Democrat praised Trump, except the opposition to Obama wasn't like, on moral grounds? With Obama, the right wasn't mad at human rights abuses or drone striking civilians. They just didn't like him and opposed him across the board. Marxist Obama! They stonewalled him out of spite and it worked really well. Also the CDC, who are really pulling through for us by quickly and effectively taking this leadership role, communicating with the American people and not contradicting each other or bowing to the whims of the political and financial ruling class. And as much as I don't want to, I do have to give some credit to the GOP as well, who very early on in the pandemic pushed the CDC and president to step up their game. And this is a serious public health threat. 
Uh, the, the, the approach of the Pain. administration so far has been, like its approach to so many other things, fundamentally unserious. And, and the time has come to ban commercial air travel from countries that have an active COVID. outbreak. The, the, the arguments the administration is giving against it don't make any sense. And, and the top priority, Sean, should be to protect the health and safety of American citizens. We need to do more. We're not doing enough. And if the president won't act, then Congress should reconvene and Congress should act to protect the American people. Very good point by Ted Cruz, who despite his party, has at least shown a lot of spine and conviction. Totally not spineless guy, Ted Cruz. And so I guess if the roles were reversed and the president was a Republican, it's good to know that they would still be taking this stance. Like, can you imagine that? If they got really concerned about an outbreak of something like Ebola during Obama's term, and then suddenly didn't care just a few years later, and we were actually showing a clip of that for comedic purposes. Outrageous that would be and would have been. The fact that we now have actual major politicians like Ted Cruz taking a stance against Big Bird getting a vaccine is unreal. It's like if an entire political party suddenly ran on the singular issue of hashtag restore the Snyder verse. But hey now, Cody Bear, Ted's not anti-vax, he just doesn't like mandates. You know how the GOP is across the board against government health mandates, except when they totally aren't when it comes to abortion, and so this isn't about the vaccine, but rather forcing people to get it. You know, the thing that Big Bird is clearly doing by, um, tweeting that he got the vaccine. A thing Sesame Street has been literally doing for decades. I don't know, man. Seems like it's not Big Bird that's changed, but rather these weird freaks suddenly calling basic PR pushes for public health measures, government propaganda, despite also being in the government. Seems like Ted Cruz probably knows this and that children's programming has always done this and is actually courting the specific anti-vaccine crowd as opposed to taking a stance against mandates. And I'm just spitballing here, but if a senator is either this stupid or disingenuous about basic reality, they should really not be a senator or really have any job where they make decisions about the lives of others. I don't even want him owning a pet, frankly. In addition to giving embarrassing necktie dweeb something to tweet about from the Senate floor, climate change can increase snowfall during winter storms and cause extreme cold snaps like the one that transformed a simple Virginia thunderstorm into a frosty f***osaurus. Additionally, there is a theory that a warming Arctic is weakening the polar jet stream and allowing frigid air to penetrate sexy further south less sexy. If that's true, it means more extreme weather events are starting to affect roadways in states that don't normally experience them, like Virginia and Texas, where last year an intense blizzard laid waste to the state's roads and power grid, leaving millions without electricity or running water and sending said necktie dweebs fleeing to Mexico to seek shelter in warmer climates. Ah, oh, hey, funny new tweet you got there about the time you left your state while people died, Ted. So glad you're a lawmaker. Good job. The very sad icing atop that weirdly bearded cake is the fact that the entirety of these United States, including Virginia, are completely unprepared for any kind of infrastructure stress. Because although infrastructure is a vital area of national health, the U.S. has never been terribly interested in maintaining it. While things look a bit better this time, Texas still didn't actually fix its energy grid. A November assessment by the nonprofit regulatory authority, the North American Electric Reliability Corps, said the state remains susceptible to a massive energy shortfall during a severe winter storm. And ERCOT, again, the state's own energy advisory group, found that the grid probably won't be able to keep up with winter demand, even under less severe conditions than 2021. In fact, a big problem back in February 2021, and again this year, was that natural gas pipelines and wells froze up in the cold weather and became unusable. But Governor Abbott hasn't done anything to start moving Texas away from its reliance on this infrastructure. He even appointed oil billionaire Paul Foster, one of his key campaign donors, to head ERCOT. So boy, it, it, it seems like this Abbott fellow is a real shitty idiot shit. But uh, hold on, Abbott haters, ah, wah, wah. It turns out he has a solution to Texas's energy problems after all. And that solution is to have the Bitcoin miners solve it. Look, one of the exciting things that, uh, about crypto also is the ability to, to unlock stranded renewables. So there are a lot of places on Earth where the sun shines a lot and the wind blows a lot, but there aren't any power lines. And so it's not economically feasible to use that energy. 
And the beauty of Bitcoin mining is if you can connect to the internet, mm -hmm. you can use that energy and, and derive value from those renewables in a way that would be impossible otherwise. And I think we're going to see in the next five to ten years massive innovations in that regard as well. Mm. Oh, great points, obviously. The, uh, the ESG narrative is very much in how much Bitcoin is consuming, whereas I think what Senator Cruz is saying is it's actually stabilizing the energy grid and it allows for higher capacity, which allows for a lot more people uh, or a lot more um, resilience against natural disasters. Damn it, Ted! Why do you keep showing up in my horny video? You have the sex appeal of a dusty attic. Ted is also pushing this idea that bringing in more crypto miners will revolutionize their grid by first siphoning stranded energy, which is a real thing. Renewable energy will go to waste if all the power generated isn't being immediately used, and oil patches will have gas flares to release pressure of excess fluids. Hot! And crypto miners could use this extra energy to mine their fake internet money. Something you might notice doesn't actually solve a power grid problem. But what Abbott and Cruz are hoping is that by bringing a lot of Bitcoin miners into the state and increasing demand for energy, then those private companies feel inspired to build new power plants there. In October, Abbott hosted a meeting at the governor's mansion where he essentially begged crypto miners to help the state attract more power plants, asking them to get me through the winter. But notice that I used the word hoping. That's because hoping for the best is a major plank of the plan, which does not actually come with any set guarantees about new power plants or locked in promises that Bitcoin miners will work in collaboration with the state and energy companies shutting down when demand spikes. Not to mention that since the entire point for these miners is to find cheap energy, it's far more likely for them to simply siphon whatever sources are most available to them. They have no obligation to use clean energy specifically. It's actually just easier to find older plants and reopen them, which is exactly what happened with a natural gas power plant in New York that had ceased operation, but was fired back up in March 2020 for the purposes of Bitcoin mining. It now uses over 14 megawatts of power, enough for 9,000 homes or one Disneyland Main Street electrical parade, the latter at least being slightly more useful than fake internet money that uses more energy than a fucking country. In other words, it was clear in the late 40s that reducing funding to the IRS would actually cost the government more money because it would hurt their ability to collect taxes. It would gunk up a system that at the time was already facing a backlog of cases. And this is where we start seeing the problem. Unfortunately, between this time and today, another thing had to happen. A man named Ronald Dildo Reagan would become the president. And RDR was of course known for the Economic Recovery Act of 1981, something for which Republicans would praise him to this day as a move that brought on economic recovery. Ronald Reagan also signed the largest tax cut in history. Mm -hmm. He reduced government regulations from Washington. Mm -hmm. He did. And economic growth exploded. Ah, yes. When Ted Dildo Cruz ran for president, he often talked about wanting to bring us back to Reagan economics. He talked about it all the damn time. But what Mr. Dildo and a lot of the other GOP dildos failed to mention about this point in history is that while yes, in 1981, Reagan passed one of the largest tax cuts in history, this was followed by him raising the taxes five times before his presidency ended. Almost once a year, he raised taxes with the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982, Social Security Amendments of 1983, the Deficit Reduction Act of 1984, Tax Reform Act of 1986, and Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1987. And these adjustments, when you do the math, appear to completely reverse the cuts he initially made. A Senate committee was formed and an investigation held. The IRS was accused of holding investigations based on personal vendettas and unreliable tips. Combined with this, the GOP had already started to vilify the IRS as one prominent Republican candidate who nobody remembers had just run on the promise to completely abolish it. This sentiment would come back with the running of the aforementioned Dildo Cruz as well. It's a very popular idea with the GOP. And so this, plus the new accusations, led to the Internal Revenue Service Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998. It was wildly popular at the time and was specifically designed to shift the power dynamic away from the IRS. 
Conservatives will pearl clutch about inflation while also bragging about low unemployment. Like Ted Cruz here, who complains about inflation while of course making fun of himself for abandoning his state during a crisis to go to Cancun, ha 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 ha, but who also brags about low unemployment in Texas. To be clear, low unemployment isn't necessarily bad, but it does contribute to inflation. And yet Ted Cruz only blames government spending for inflation, saying it's caused by reckless Democrat spending and spending $1.9 trillion on a so-called COVID relief bill. He then warns about Democrats increasing taxes, even though increasing taxes would likely have a slowing effect on inflation. He also complains about gas price inflation, which to remind you was caused primarily by gas supply shocks due to war, but argues against spending on any kind of green energy infrastructure, which would reduce our dependence on oil and prevent oil inflation. But Ted Cruz isn't stupid. Well, maybe he is, I, he probably is, but that's not important. It doesn't matter. The point is inflation is just the excuse he uses to push his agenda. And he ignores actual economics, which is the same thing that Joe Manchin is doing when he opposes the Build Back Better bill, which would set up green energy infrastructure because he's concerned about inflation. Hey, wowee, whoa, another episode of Cody Comps, the name of the thing you watched. Be sure to stay tuned for more episodes of Cody Comps, where I talk for more than an hour over the span of years about a subject of a person who sucks. And you know what? Click that bell. Ding, ding, for YouTube reasons. <laughs> That's the internet noise. It's not. I tried. Not very hard. Thanks.